Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My bride, Cindy, always wants me to start out by saying this. The sign of the cross in Hawaiian. Maka'inoa o kamakua ke keiki a meke uhane hemalele. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to have a great show today. We're going to talk about uh, God's Grandeur, a new book that's come out by uh, Sophia, one of my, my publisher actually, too. And we're going to just dig into uh, the, the beautiful creation of the universe and the, the origins of life with our guest, Dr. Brian Miller. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're glad to announce uh, my new book uh, being published by Sophia, as they, they've published my other books, is called 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? It's a book that was inspired by my wife, who's a cowgirl. Uh, as we were riding uh, in the car, going around Diamond Head, she said, you're going to love this song. And she leaned over and she turned up this song. Uh, the woman is singing, where have all the cowboys gone? Where's my John Wayne? And, you know, when Cindy and I go out and visit, and we're speaking different places. The women, at some point, they'll come up, usually before we can even get in the door, and they'll say, please tell our men we, we need for them to be men again. And so uh, I... I'm going to introduce a little bit of part of each of the book over the over the next little while in, in these short opening segments. Um, one part of the book I talk about is a man's got to have a creed and live by a code. To me, a creed is something that is kind of defines who you are. You should be able to define yourself in one or two sentences, what you're really all about. I think Jesus, the essence of God is that God is love. And perhaps the, the, the creed, the creed of Jesus would be, uh, would be uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And perhaps also, which is consistent with that, thy will be done, his, his creed. Um, and then we need to live by a code. And what that is, that's looking at different areas of your life, different elements of your life, and how you choose ahead of time how you'll respond. And that's what, you know, as a, as a Benedictine oblate, uh, there's, the, the, there's the rule of St. Benedict. As, a, as my dad was a Marine, as a Marine, they had the creed like Semper Fi, but then there's a code that they live by also. I think even the Boy Scouts have that and the Girl Scouts and and uh, Cowboys have a code that they live by. And so in my book, uh, we talk about that. So I want you to consider uh, today, what is your creed? Think about it. Seriously, what is it that you, the, what's, what one or two sentences defines who you are? And then in the, as the weeks go by, we'll start breaking down the rules to live by the the uh, live by your code. So 12, 12 rules for manliness. We're all follow the cowboys gone. It's available everywhere in bookstores and on Amazon and uh, at Sophia and at our website, deepadventure.com. So today I'm doing this interview. If you're watching it on YouTube, you can see I'm wearing glasses because I'm going to try to act really smart. I, we have with us today, I'm going to read you his bio because I'm not even smart enough to, to try to understand it. Dr. Brian Miller is a research coordinator for the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. He holds a bachelor's of science in physics with a minor in, in engineering from MIT, I've heard of them, and a PhD in physics from Duke. He speaks internationally on the topics of intelligent design and the impact of the world views on society. And so we're, we're so glad to have Dr. Brian Miller here with us, and we're going to talk about a new compilation of material called God's Grandeur, uh, the Catholic case for intelligent design. And uh, I have this uh, first question right off the bat. What is that called? The fid, 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 What's the word, the mathematical terminology, fid, Fibucci effect? What is that? Oh, um, that that looks like, um, I forget the exact name for the <laughs> for the pattern on the book cover. I have to figure that out. Fibonacci or something like that. Fibonacci, yeah, it's a Fibonacci effect. That's right. It's so cool. All right. So I already stumped him, you guys, right off the bat. That's how smart my questions are. But do you want to explain it to us, or we're we going to wait till we get a math, math, mathematician on to explain that to us? That picture uh, what on the happens cover. Is, what happens uh, is you have what's called the Fibonacci series in mathematics. Oh, oh, he, he is smart enough. He went to MIT and Duke. Okay. So, so what happens is you can, create, you can create patterns based on that particular 
mathematical pattern. And actually, when you look at life, there's certain patterns like the um, seeds in a sunflower that will follow something like a Fibonacci series or other mathematical formulas, which is really quite remarkable. Isn't it cool? I mean, like when we go out and we're spearfishing, we see these shells out there that look very much like this this uh, this circular sort of uh, design. You know, I was reading, sitting at the beach having a cigar with my son a couple of weeks ago and was reading this book and he looked at the cover and he goes, that's the Fibonacci effect. And I go, never heard of it. So he was, he was, he was blown away. It was on the cover of the book and that his dad was reading something that smart. But, um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this book for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is my wife, Cindy and I are going through the book of Genesis. So I have a Stephen K K Stephen Ray's new book on, on, on Genesis, the Bible study guide, which talks all about uh, creation and the origins of life. And uh, this book does this beautiful combination. I think it, it, it does a great job of bringing together science, philosophy, and theology. It's the synthesis of that. There's three different sections on this. And what, what inspired this book, Brian? Well, well, what happened is there are several scientists who have been working on the um, evidence for design in nature. And both in identifying it and also in showing how that helps you do better research. And one of the early pioneers of this research program was a woman named Ann Gager. And Ann Gager is a con convert to Catholicism. And she was very influential in helping to bring me back to the Catholic Church also and inspiring me to really study the evidence of design in nature. So what she realized is there wasn't as many people writing about this topic in Catholic circles. So what she did is she um, coordinated with, as you mentioned, with Catholic scholars who are scientists, philosophers, theologians, and other academics to present a clear case, both scientifically, philosophically, and theologically for the overwhelming evidence of design in nature and how that can inspire us in our faith and help us to understand um, nature in our own faith in a deeper way. Well, I want to get deeper into that. I know, um, for example, Anton Flew, the great, uh, the great atheist. Uh, who I think was part of the Inklings or hung out with C.S. Lewis back in the day. And uh, and he actually had a conversion experience, I think because of the double helix of the DNA uh, molecule. What was your, what is that, is it, first of all, does that, does that sound right? And also, so what was your journey back? Did you have faith when you were younger or what was your journey back to faith? Sure. Well, Anthony Flew, he um, obviously was one of the prominent atheist philosophers and what happened is he started to read about the evidence of design in the cell, things mm. like the amazing machinery in the cell that helps to process information, process energy. Um, you have auto assembly plants, you've got manufacturing systems. And this overwhelming evidence of design uh, caused him to abandon his atheism and believe in a creator. And I, I have a very similar story because I was raised Catholic. But what happened was I read Richard Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker. And he, um, if you're not familiar with Richard Dawkins, he's one of the patron saints of atheism. He's one of and the four horsemen of the, what do they call of, of the new enlightenment? The, the new something. atheists. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. And, and he argued that, would, it, that everything in nature can be explained by natural processes, including biology. So he says, you might think you see evidence of design in biology, but it's all an illusion. So he convinced me that people that believed in God were did so because they just weren't that scientific, they weren't that intellectual, they were driven more by their feelings. And I became, uh, I started to really doubt God's existence, but I realized if God didn't exist, then life is pretty much pointless because it doesn't matter if we're happy, if we're sad, if we're kind, if we're, if we're cruel, because we'll eventually die, our planet will eventually explode when the sun explodes and eventually all life will cease. So it's all just a cosmic joke and a cosmic accident. So I said, God, I don't know if you exist, but if you do exist, you have to prove it to me because I'm a scientist. I just can't accept this on blind faith. And what happened is I can really see God's hand of directing me to people that were experts in um, science, experts in, in philosophy, who helped show me that the evidence from nature points to a creator very clearly. And that with as, as well as other studies into the resurrection, and personal experiences with God brought me back to faith. So it was really both an intellectual journey and encountering God in a very deep way. That's 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 a short version of that story, I'm sure. We're talking with Dr. Brian Miller in the new book, or the new, uh, I guess, the anthology uh, edited by Ann Gouger. Is that how you're saying? Gager, Gager. Ann Gager. PhD, who was instrumental in bringing you back to the church. 
God's grandeur. It's uh, it, it's a it's just a wonderful book. So we're ta- we we got to take a break here in a moment, but I wanted to to ask you. Um, so you were raised as a Catholic, and then you 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 made this. Re- did you did you stop going to mass when you big? Did you stop practicing your faith, or were you just kind of a, 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 a agnostic at that time, or or? Well, what happened was I, I would still go to church, and 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 during my college years, I I sort of drifted away from the Catholic Church into more evangelical circles, and then what happened was mm. um, through my graduate school years, through the, my studies of science and through other other um, venues of discussion, I came back to faith in God and Christianity, and then it was um, a, a very slow journey that brought me back into the Catholic Church. Now we'll talk about that one after this break because I because I, I, I it's it's fascinating to me the way God the adventure that we all have and the way we'll, God will lead us if we let him let him do that. We're talking with D- Dr. Brian Miller. He's a he's one of the authors of the new book God's Grandeur by Sophia. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue. Through Bears Man Cave Community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been? And how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion. Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, and you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. It's a beautiful day here in paradise. I'm looking out my window. Uh, the, her, this is a recorded interview with Dr. Brian Miller, and I'm looking out my window. Uh, Hurricane Dora is about 600 miles south of here, pushing uh, advisory level waves uh, here to Waikiki Beach. So uh, after this interview and the next one, I'm going to meet a friend of mine. We're going to go out and get some waves. So, But, you know, as I look out at this, the, when you, people come to Hawaii, it often causes them to have this moment of not just recreation, but recreation. They ponder this beauty uh this beauty of God, and they ponder the the wonder of the universe. You know, I, I was talking to someone the other day about. I guess they're thinking that they were saying, "Well, all animals uh, are the same as humans." You know, we're, they're they're the same because they're all they all are aware. Uh, they have an awareness uh, uh, of themselves. And she said, "My cat, when when she looks in the mirror, um, she's aware that that's her in the mirror." And I go, "Well, that could be, but but is your cat aware that she's aware?" You know, there's a certain um, something about the soul, the in, in, the infused spiritual, rational soul of, of people, that uh, that um, is is it, it, we wonder about our very own nature. As King David said, "I am fearfully and wonderfully made." And the other thing is that um, is that we uh, have this sense of beauty, 
Like, where does that come from? I don't think a dog understands beauty. I don't think, a, even though a bird can be beautiful, I don't think it understands beauty. You know, it, it's something that's in the spiritual, rational soul of, of, of only humans. And we're talking with, father, father, with Dr. Brian Miller, the author of a new book, God's Grandeur. And uh, we're going to get into the um, intelligent design and the grandeur of the universe. But you were saying, I, I went. I had a similar experience when I was in college. I had a it was a little bit different, but I did have a conversion experience as a Catholic in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, but I had been under catechized. And so I drifted into the non-denominational world until eventually I came to the new catechism is mind blowing because it's a mixture of philosophy and, and uh, theology and tradition. And I, and that uh, that's what brought me and Stephen Ray's book crossing the Tiber because I went back to the primitive church that's what brought me back to the church. How was your journey? So you, you, as you returned to God, your first experience was to with your evangelical friends, and then what brought you back to the church? Well, I have to say, I have to just say that I deeply, deeply appreciate um, my connections in the evangelical world. They taught me how to appreciate Scripture, how to share my faith. So I, I would never disparage uh, any of the people that I'm still friends with. Amen. But. For me, the question was really, what is the source of authority? What did Jesus establish? And when you go back to church history, you see this very clear pattern where Jesus established a visible church with visible leaders, the apostles, and how if you look at early church history, it was very important to those leaders to then pass on that apostolic authority to the next generation. So you had these leaders that were caretakers for the church, that they protected truth, they protected doctrine, and it was something that God really honored. And what happens, I find, in Protestant circles, is there's lots of misconceptions about the Catholic Church, about mm -hmm. early church history. There's misconceptions about the theology. And I realized that was sort of a challenge I faced, is all these misconceptions. So for me, coming back to the church really was going back to church history and also studying more deeply theology, like the theology of, of Mary, the theology of, of the saints. And I realized that uh, that the, the coherency and the logic and the, even the mm. beauty of the Catholic Church mm. just overwhelmed me. So it was both an intellectual journey. And then I had this really interesting experience where I was at a conference talking about faith and culture, and, and you had some very trendy Christian speakers talking about their ideas. And then there's these Dominican sisters that uh, <laughs> that were these uh, nurses at uh, Thomas Aquinas University in Nashville spoke. Mm -hmm. Wow! And when they spoke, you you could feel the authority of God fall in the room. There was sort of this this reverence, this awe, yeah. because they were speaking not just their own opinions, but they were speaking from what Christians have believed since the beginning. This this um, this authority of historic Christian theology is carried down by the church that a lot of those elements actually brought me back to faith to and the you know, Catholic church. Exactly. I have a friend that I'm, that was a high school football player, a friend of mine still holds world, the record at Baylor for the longest um, field goal, 60 yards. Uh, and he, and he has a group of Christians that he meets with that are not Catholic and he's not Catholic. He's Baptist. And they're, and they're studying philosophy and theology together. Well, if you do that, you eventually have to come to Aquinas and Augustine and the great Eastern uh, thinkers, you know, the Greek, the great, the Greeks, you know, uh, before that. And, and, it, and what I love about the catechism is it, it proposes things and, and submits things to you to, to consider so that you prayerfully and rationally consider them. <clears throat> but um, I also love the Catholic Church is also uh, where it doesn't know, it doesn't know. So it'll say, um, for example, when John Paul II and uh, also ben Benedict wrote uh, about, uh, for example, intelligent design, they said how there, there's a lot of evidence for intelligent design. There's a lot of evidence that in some part, maybe evolution had to do with all of this. Uh, but at, certainly at some point, there was a big bang. And certainly at some point, there was the first man and the first woman. But they, they're, not, they're not giving uh, their opinion on something that, there's, that, that they don't know. You know. Some of it still is a mystery. But this book, uh, but that leaves the door open for us to really dig into this area of intelligent design. And, uh, uh, you know, it, I've always been fascinated with cosmo cosmology. I've, I'm always reading the latest book, but, it, but all the theories keep changing. So can you catch us up to date? The first thing you talk about in this book that synthesizes theology, philosophy, and science is uh, intelligent design in, the, in, the, in the, the beginning of the universe, or is there a beginning? 
you first posed that question. Yes, and in and I, and I did two chapters in the book. The first was on cosmology, and there was two major discoveries in the in cosmology. For those of you that may not familiar with the term, is just the study of our universe, how our universe began, how it developed, and what people realized in the earlier part of the nineteen hundreds, the nineteenth century is or the twentieth century, is that the universe had a beginning. And that was pretty shocking to a lot of people, because if you go back to even the ancient Greeks, many thought the universe was eternal. And even as, as far as up to the 20th century, many people thought it was eternal, and people like that. Because if you're a scientist who doesn't believe in a creator, then if the universe always was here, you wouldn't have to explain where it came from. But then because of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, because of the observation that our universe is expanding, people realized that if, if you have a, a balloon that's expanding like our universe, if you go back in time, it had to start. <laughs> and that's shocking because what that means is that time, space, matter, and energy all had a beginning because they're all interrelated. So that suggested that whatever started the universe is outside of our universe that's infinitely powerful, that's timeless, that's spaceless, that started mm. our universe at a point in an explosion of energy, which sounds a whole lot like Genesis, in the beginning God said, let there be light. And the second discovery was that the laws of nature appeared to be designed for the purpose of allowing life to exist in our universe. Because if you imagine that you had a machine that created universes, it was kind of a universe starter kit that you got for Christmas. And there's lots of dials, and you can control every detail of the universe you wanna start. So if you turn one dial up, gravity gets stronger, you feel heavier. You turn the dial down, gravity feels less uh, weaker and you feel less heavy. Well, many of those dials have to be carefully set or the universe would not support life. So if gravity were too strong or too weak, no planets, no stable stars, no life. If the force that held atoms together, the, the um, force that held electrons to protons and attracted them, if that were too strong or too weak, you wouldn't have carbon or oxygen in the universe and no life. And there's countless other examples of how our universe had to be designed per, um, very carefully to allow life to exist, which again points to a creator behind our universe. So give, give us some numbers. Uh, I know that in, in reading the book, there's numbers like it would take, it would take the odds of, of it are more than like one in billions and billions and billions. Give us a couple examples of those because there was one you mentioned that would have to be the odds are that there would have to be more more zeros than there are atoms in the universe or something. So can you give us a couple of those? Oh, sure, certainly. And one example is gravity because if gravity were too strong or too weak, what would happen is you wouldn't have stable stars that were capable of producing the right amount of carbon and oxygen to allow for life because life has to have carbon. It's the only element that has the properties that allow for the complex uh, structures and biological systems. And oxygen is essential because of its, its capacity to carry energy. And what happens is the gravity, if you imagine all possible values of gravity that you might expect, and the highest value of gravity would be what's would be equivalent to what's called the strong nuclear force. And that's what holds protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. So if you imagine that as sort of the possibilities, the narrow range of those possibilities would be like one part in 10 to the power of 35. That's like a one with 35 zeros. That's like one in a trillion, 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 trillion. Uh, so that's an extraordinarily uh, careful fine tuning of gravity. And just to give you an analogy for those that oh. may not like big numbers, is imagine that you shoot a target and if you're a really good marksman, you might be able to hit a target that's, let's say, an inch by an inch or a centimeter by a centimeter that's 100 yards away. Well, the precision necessary to set gravity, you would have to hit a target the size of a penny at the other end of our solar system. That's the precision we're talking about. And the example you gave uh, was the most interesting example, and that's called the order of the universe or the well, entropy let, of the universe. Let's take it away. I want to talk about entropy. That's a, just, that's a sure. fascinating subject all by itself. We're talking with Dr. Brian Miller in the new book that he's, he's one of the contributors in God's grandeur. I, I love this subject. It's about uh, the uh, origin of the universe, the origin of life. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure.
This is Daniel the Moon Markham with another episode of Country Up. Death. Some folks frequently walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I suppose I've brushed death more than most and less than some others. At the tender age of 12, I pulled my cousin, aged 10, out of the cold water of the Columbia River. He was a goner. I wept. A year later, my pa, who had just turned 58, died from his third heart attack. I watched him heaving for air on his deathbed. That weren't pretty. Worked as a deckhand on the Columbia River Bar, the graveyard of the Pacific. The Grim Reaper had me in his crosshairs more than once. It was from the same waters as a young man I wrestled three bodies out of the pounding surf on Benson Beach. As a pastor, I was often called to folks on their deathbed. I learned to look forward to those times, strange as that may seem. As death comes close, folks get serious-like about themselves, their lives, and eternity. One such time was with an old farmer by the name of Bob Fredenberg. Now, Bob was a crusty old codger. Whenever he came to town, he was wearing that same pair of tattered and dirty coveralls, always with a servant of cow manure on at least one of his boots. Talk with a loud nasally twang, never a sentence lacking a cuss word or two. I was straight with Bob that day about death and eternity. Bob opened his heart to the Lord that day. As he did, Bob's demeanor in the room changed from the cold power of death to the glow of godly light. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We've been talking about gravity, and there's a theory in uh, in physics of the uh, infinite, uh, uh, infinite, uh, infinitely dense place. And I know uh, I identify with that. I think uh, a lot of people have called me that, that I'm infinitely dense. But we have with us as a guest today, Dr. Brian Miller. We're talking about the new book, God's Grandeur, and really the ontological principle that the universe appears uh, not only to be created, uh, by an intelligent uh, mind, but that it was also created with you in God's mind. It was like an arrow shot. You're like an arrow shot from the heart of God from that moment when he said, let there be light coming all the way to you. And the moment that he infused in you, a, your own unique spiritual, rational soul so that you could commune with him. So Dr. Brian Miller, we were talking, you're about to, to go into another uh, example. Can you, can you continue with what our last discussion? But certainly. And the most extreme example is with the entropy of the early universe. And entropy is just the level of disorder. So a really messy room with everything randomly placed would have a, a high entropy, or high disorder, and everything neat and tidy would be a low entropy state. So if you imagine um, all possible entropies that the early universe would have, it would be anywhere from really zero to, let's say, that of a black hole. That would be a reasonable first state of the universe. And there is a famous physicist named Robert, uh, Roger Penrose who said the probability 
that our universe by chance would start with such a low entropy state or high level of order, which is necessary for life, is like one chance in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. And, and that number is unimaginably small. So like one to 10 to the power of 10 to the 123 is a one with a huge number of zeros, 10 to the 123 zeros. So to write that number, if you wrote a one and wrote a zero on every single atom in the visible universe, you couldn't even at, you couldn't even write down the the breadth of that number. So it's really extraordinary. So you're talking again about me being infinitely dense. And now this is an analogy of how tiny my pea brain is. But um, we're talking with Dr. Brian Miller. Very humbling to have you on our show. Uh, and so so this this ontological uh, sense that the universe is created, and uh, and it was created with with us in mind. Um, and so that 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 begs the and and I think most scientists are saying the universe is around 13 billion years old. And wasn't it uh, a Catholic priest that had part of that part of that? Uh, um, um, I, I don't know if it's the word of discovery to bring that to us. I forget his name. Was he French? I forget what his name was. Yeah, Lamatra. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. I think a Belgian, uh, both a Belgian. priest okay. and a cosmologist. And it, it's really a fascinating story because when Einstein developed his equations of general relativity, which are called the field equations. He realized that the equation suggested the universe was either expanding or contracting, which again points to a beginning. He didn't like that idea. He was very uncomfortable, as many physicists were, with the idea of the universe having a beginning. For some, like Fred Hoyle, they realized it pointed to a creator, which they were very uncomfortable about. And what happened is Einstein took his equations, and in his equations, you had this extra term called the cosmological constant. So he set that number to the perfect value to allow for a static universe because of his resistance to the beginning of the universe. And so and, he so he started with the assumption that the universe was e eternal. Yeah. And and said it's so not very scientific. And so he had to plug that number in in order to to assert that. Exactly. And in the, and he realized that that was the big he described that as the biggest blunder of his life because he could have been the one who could have anticipated the Big Bang. But then others took his equation, people like Friedman, people like Lamatra, and they realized that the mathematics suggested that the universe actually had a beginning. So they actually proposed this idea of, of um, they used terms like a, uh, of, of like a, I can't remember the exact term, but like a cosmic egg or just this explosion of energy. So it really was uh, Lamatra, this Belgian priest that had this idea for the first time of a, bi of a big bang or the beginning of the universe in that nature. Well, that's isn't that interesting? How I, this is the arrogance of science. Uh, um, you know, I, I had a, a you know, it, it it it's supposed to be based on hypothesis and testing those hypotheses, and yet there seems to be a real element of faith in what that when they're asserting the universe had no beginning. They're they're like they're asserting there is no God, and then all science is based on a false assumption. You're going to get false results, and and so that's kind of a really big leap of faith for someone to say there is no God. Um, and yet, as, so as as but as Catholics and as Christians, it all makes sense to me that there is one God, and that there is and that there is um, there is um, and that and that truth is truth is truth is truth. There's no conflict between science, theology, and philosophy. And there, that has to be consistent if God is truth. And so um, it's it's arrogant to assume there isn't a, a God unless you can. It's hard to prove there isn't something. But as Christians, it's so easy for me to look and see, yes, of course, there's a God. Even if, And why is it, though? Why is it, uh, Brian, why? Talk with Dr. Brian Miller, one of the authors, uh, contributors of the book God's Grandeur by Sophia. Why is it that if you go out in nature, if you go out, if they find a, a, all over the world, and if they find like an undiscovered tribe someplace, they all have religion. Why is it in the very nature of man to have an upward yearning? And then you look at you look at the wonder of your own body, you look at the wonder of the universe, and you, you got to believe there's there's a mind behind that all. It just didn't accidentally happen. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, this goes really back to the Apostle Paul, who said in the book of Romans, in the first chapter, that God deliberately designed the universe in such a way that you could see his glory throughout the universe, his divine character, his, his internal qualities. But people suppress the truth. 
And this really goes back to the ancient Greeks, because the same debates we have today about design and nature took place 500 BC between people like Democritus and people like Aristotle and Plato. And what happened is when the church start, grew in prominence in the Middle Ages, it became taken for granted that you see the evidence of God's of God in creation. You see the order, you see the purpose. What happened though is during the Enlightenment, um, people. Well, why do why do they call it that? It seems like they it was the darkest. The, the darkness started to fall when they with their with their thinking. Now, that's the Enlightenment is a well. They must have chosen it themselves. It was good marketers. <laughs> like a lot of it's good marketers. Yeah, good good PR. You, you really see this that you, once philosophers like Hume and Rousseau and, and eventually Freud became more prominent, people wanted to reconstruct their view of reality without a creator for various reasons. And what happened is they, in many ways, rewrote history because science, modern science, was developed by Christians, by people who recognized that the world was created. So they expected to see order in the world. And they believed that God created them with the capacity to understand this, that order. And they also recognize that we're fallen, we're flawed. So we've got to do experiments because we can't purely trust our rationality. So it was the Christian theology that created a uh, the, the fertile soil for scientific investigation and discovery. And what happened is when secular philosophers who didn't want to believe in God or his relevance came to dominance, they rewrote history and created what's called the warfare myth between faith and science, which right. is entirely untrue. Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, the beauty of, uh, of, uh, you know, I, like John Paul II went, I think he was, I forget where he was speaking. I'd give up all these anecdotes. I think it was to mathematicians. And he said, when you follow mathematics or when you follow this science, it'll bring you to God. In fact, if you study history, if you study any truth, is related to to truth and God. When God, uh, if, you know, when the earth, think about it, the Hebrews were, I think, the only ones that believed there was only one God. There were, I think, maybe, uh, you know, and it was it was this pantheon of drama taking place in the heavens. How can you do science with that? But if you have the the one Creator with a mind that created, then you can start to do science. And so, without that, science wouldn't be wouldn't have gotten. And, you know, the Catholic Church, I think, created the first 130 universities and uh, the first the telescope in, uh, in the Vatican. And, and so there's no, there's no distinction between, between science and, uh, and philosophy and theology. They, they should go hand in hand. They're beautiful. We're talking with Dr. Brian Miller in his new book. He's a contributor of the, of the new book, God's Grandeur, uh, uh, published by Sophia Publishing. And uh, we'll be right back with more Dr. Brian Miller. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wastick adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak Adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Bear and Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel.
still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm supposed to invite you to go to deepadventure.com, invite the woman to become part of the Mama Bears. And if you do, you get to have uh, access to one year of curriculum on, on the on uh, the virtues, which you can uh, lead your children uh, through, especially your single moms. Uh, it's a great tool for you to use with your children. And then, uh, and then you can join uh, Bears Man Cave in the School of Manliness. It's a three-year curriculum on uh, what it means to be a man. And when you join the Man Cave, you are actually part of a non-Facebook type community too. So like last night, all of us got together. Once a month, we get together for a Zoom call and we talk about that month's curriculum. It's also a great tool for you single moms, uh, to give to to lead your sons through that that school of manliness and fathers who come to become members the first thing they do is they turn around and they look at their sons and lead them through that curriculum too i don't know of anything else like it uh we you should at least go and check it out at deepadventure.com bears man cave the mama bears in the school of manliness we're talking with with dr brian miller about the new book god's grandeur by sophia publishing which happens to be my publisher my new book 12 rules for manliness where have all the cowboys gone is out it'll be out uh soon so you can go and pre-order that. Uh, so we've talked about the nature of creation. We've talked about how it seemed like, like um, all of that had had to be created the way it was, so that life could exist. What about the origins of life, and specifically uh, of mankind? Well, what what happens is again, I mentioned how this debate about nature goes back to the ancient Greeks, and what happened is you have people like Democritus who were the ancient materialists, maybe like the Richard Dawkins of their day, who argued everything can be explained by the laws of nature, chance, and time. But who made the laws of nature? I mean, that I, I don't... Yeah, okay, well, the laws of nature say this, so... But who made the laws of nature? Who's the lawgiver? Well, for people from that philosophical perspective, both then and today, they'd say the laws have always been there. The laws are sort of the source of everything. <laughs> Uh, and they have no explanation for the laws where they came from. They just are eternal. And what happened is others like Plato and Aristotle and eventually the Christians and obviously the, the, the Hebrews, they believed that matter in of itself could not come together and self-organize to explain what to see everything we see in the world today. There's just too much order. So they believe there was a mind behind the universe. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is the philosophy of scientific materials and the belief that everything is just simply a product of chance, time, and natural processes dominated the sciences in the 20th century. It just eventually took over. But what's happened is discoveries over the last several decades have caused the pendulum to shift back to the idea of a mind, to the idea of a creator. And those can be seen very clearly in the origin of life, because the question becomes, could the first cell have originated through blind, undirected processes or do you see evidence of a mind? And what happens, and I explain this in the chapter, that all physical processes will take systems and go from order to disorder. It's like a neat room becoming messy or going from high energy to low energy. That's like water running downhill. That's like high energy molecules that you see in life breaking into simple lower energy molecules. But the origin of life requires the opposite. It requires materials, uh, molecules, to be put into a state of high order and high energy, which never happens without help. So the only way a cell sustains itself and reproduces is because there's incredibly sophisticated molecular machinery that can process energy from the environment and turn it into a form that drives a cell. In addition, the cell contains lots and lots of information. You have information in DNA, information in proteins, and the information are the instruction manual for the cell. They tell the machinery how to operate to produce all of the components that they need and how to function. So without information and machinery, life would simply break apart into simple molecules. So a cell could not form accidentally through natural processes. Plus, it shows indisputable evidence of design in the machinery, the information processing, the energy production, and its overall order, which points to a creator. It, it has to, you know, when, when God said, and I love that, that the the order, the design, uh, 
it's, I, we, I was talking with Cindy about this. My, my, my wife, uh, the other day as we were walking out, I always love to see order. I love to see things that are like a, a sailboat is all is, uh, you know, the, sailing on a Beneteau. It's all every, every element is that precisely, precisely thought through and functions with a, with, in a beautiful and orderly way. Uh, I like to see a human body that's 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 functioning, that's strong and athletic. You know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see. It all goes back to the element of what is good. And when and when God created, when God created, or when you see graffiti or you see trash on the ground, why does that make us recoil in some way? Um, I guess we call that the entropy, the opposite of that order. And so when you see when God said, "Let there be light," He had an, an He 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 had a thought. He had an intention. And uh, and and then the Bible says, and there was light. God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. And He saw that it was good. And so this order—they say orderliness is next to godliness. Yeah, it is. It is. It absolutely is. When you see things that are in their right order, what Aquinas is teaching on natural law, for example, of things like that, you're just drawn to it. It just makes sense. So, what about the origin then of of um, uh, do you go in? Do you go into the origin of of uh, mankind, Adam and Eve, the yeah, first I, humans? I, 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 Ann Gager, she addresses that. She's addressed that topic, and I believe that's in the book. And what happens is the standard story. If you assume we are just a product of blind chance, you assume that we develop through this undirected atheistic evolutionary process. And what happens is you see images to support that, like you may have seen this nice progression going from like an ape-like creature gradually right. to a human all the and, way to us all the way to a surfer exactly it's exactly. the next the step highest, beyond yeah the, the highest, highest form of human. order in the, in the, in the universe <laughs> well the people that are experts in the field know that the, those images are not accurate because if you look at to the actual evidence of the fossils what you see is a, is a jump where you've got ape-like creatures and then you have essentially human-like creatures. And there's a what people in the field will call a quantum leap. And there are lots of other fossils. And what happens is those fossils are more like cousins. There's not a nice linear progression going from an ape-like creature to us, but there's just a lot of different creatures out there. And we seem to be this, this creation event. And it's very clear that we are not an accident because if you look at mathematical analyses, of how fast an undirected evolutionary process could take place. And I'm talking about an atheistic version of evolution. It, it, there's a paper by Dred and Schmidt, I believe it was 2008. They talk about with human ancestors, if you wanted to acquire two specific mutations for our human ancestors, it would take a hundred million years for two mutations. But if you look at the human brain and the trillions of new connections we have, that would take vastly more information than there was time to produce. Also, what's happened is there's a revolution taking in biology, which is partly the result of engineers working more with biologists. Because when biologists looked at the human body or other aspects of life, they often assumed it looked poorly designed. They'd say no competent engineer would ever do something like our knee or like the appendix. But what's happened is as people with more knowledge about the biology, and particularly engineers, have looked at the biology, they consistently find- How cool find, is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, one of the people that's done this is Stuart Burgess, who has some beautiful articles on the knee and other human uh, aspects, uh, structures. And they found that what happened is that people thought they were poorly designed because they weren't trained as engineers. But when engineers look at these features, they consistently see- that the human body looks optimally designed with a level of perfection and ingenuity that vastly surpasses human engineering. Well, now you're embarrassing me. I mean, I'm looking in the mirror. I'll have to be looking at myself in a different light. But uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. So, so the so uh, and there was also not just this quantum leap, uh, you know, in terms of the the structure of the of humans, but you saw that uh, this. This I don't know how many thousands of years ago, maybe 20,000, 30, 40,000 years ago, you began to see engineering. You began to see real tools, yeah. and you began to see beauty. Yeah. You began to yeah. see drawings on caves, as G.K. Chesterton uh, talked about, right? There's a, there's a leap in every way, not just intellectually, but uh, and when you think of beauty, it has to be somewhat spiritually too, right? And you see them, you see uh, there's got to be a first Adam and a first Eve. 
Yeah, and, and you really see that that there is this explosion of what looks like ingenuity and genius um, with humans. So, and again, there's a lot of um, unanswered questions. There's lots of different of opinions about different details, but we can say very clearly that the human body looks like it was designed by God in a creative act. And we see clear capacities of the human body that were designed to have a relationship with God. We were designed to have the ability to make and use tools. We're designed to advance our culture, which is very consistent with Catholic theology. You know, what's really cool is that Dr. Brian Miller is joining us, his new book, God's Grandeur is a lot of times you have these kind of discussions, it leaves it leaves more confusion than answers. But the clarity in which we've we've had this conversation has been really profound. And we thank you for joining us on the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We hope we get to stay in touch with me, maybe have you back again. Um, thank you, Dr. Miller. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I know that. I know it was a pleasure. I'm just kidding. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell. 